speakers. We have Lonnie Malmberg, who is the owner of Euphoric Geological Services, and she's been grazing goats on the Western Range for over 25 years. So she uses goats to gradually and naturally remove weeds and return the land to a healthy ecosystem. Lonnie wanders the meadows, hillsides, and waterways of the West with 1,500 cashmere goats who are grazing and browsing unwanted weeds that infest the landscape. So we'll also hear from Doug Bartels, who has a small row crop farm in Calhoun County, Iowa. And since 2009, Doug uh, first uh, bought his herd and has been using 36 goats to custom graze about 30 acres of neglected windbreaks and uh, fallow acreages. And first, I want to draw your attention to the, we have five more farm owners coming up this winter, the last being March 31st. And just a little bit, a little plug for PFI. So PFI is a nonprofit organization founded in 1985, and we're a group of farmers and friends of farmers that want to learn from each other. So we're member-driven and farmer-led. We put on lots of field days, events, our annual conference, and we do a ton of on-farm research. Uh, our mission is to facilitate farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchange of knowledge and information sharing. And of course, we welcome everyone as members. We, are, we value viable farms for now and the future, and we value stewardship and ecology for Iowa. And if you, are, if you appreciate all of the information that we give out, and um, you use our services and learn from our members, please consider joining Practical Farmers if you're not a member already, you can find membership information online at practicalfarmers.org. And I do want you to look at our events page. We always are constantly updating our upcoming events on the website. Um, we put our events on there, our partners' events, and next month we will be planning our field days for the coming summer and fall season so be on the lookout for this year's field day guides and the field days on our event calendar which will be released in may and just a couple housekeeping rules before we get started we want you to enter your name email address and location if you haven't already in the chat box please fill out the poll on the right hand column there above the pictures and then please ask your questions in the chat box and we'll reserve the last half hour for questions. And always remember that we archive all of our farminars and they are available on our website under the farminar tab. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Doug Bartels who is going to present on what he's been doing in Iowa and then we'll turn it over to Lonnie after that. So Hi, welcome Megan, Doug. How are you? Awesome. Uh, let me make sure this is working. Okay. Is it up on you guys' side? It sure is. We can hear you really well. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I guess I thought I'd start um, by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Doug Bartles, and along with my wife, Jamie, and our daughter, Lily, we live on a family century farm near Litton, Iowa. And besides the row crop farming, I manage some turkey buildings, and Jamie substitute teaches, and then she also helps her family run their restaurant business. Uh, Lily, she just turned six months old, and she's probably the happiest baby I know. So uh, just a little bit about us. Um, uh, this is us here. We got interested in goats in 2009. Uh, a friend of ours dropped off his herd to help clean up around our grove and some machinery. And uh, he later informed us that he was under strict instructions to never bring them back. Apparently, they had escaped at his place and had eaten all of his wife's flowers. So that's kind of how we got we got into uh, into the goat stuff. So uh, that was back in 2009, and. Um, Originally, we were trying to, with uh, rotational grazing, we were trying to reduce our feed costs 
and uh, we were going to use other people's lands to do it. We started with uh, 18 head of mixed breed, mixed breed goats. Uh, most of those were boar goats. Um, five load rolls of electro netting, one fencer, uh, trailer, and lots of ambition. So, uh, but I, like I said, we were pretty impressed at the work the goats had accomplished, and um, we also just enjoyed the animals in general. They each had their own personality. We didn't have much to start with. Uh, like I said before, some rolls of electro net, a fencer, and this old trailer in the picture that I'm pretty sure came over on the Mayflower. Uh, we were pretty excited to be working with the goats, though, uh, through some custom grazing. Uh, again, here, here's a, oops, lost a page here. Okay. Oh yeah, I'll go back a page here. Uh, here's again is the startup cost. The 18 goats uh, we got pretty reasonable, I would say, $100 a head. Uh, the trailer that I was talking about uh, was in our family forever, so it was just kind of a, something we had sitting on the farm. Had the five rolls of Electronet fence that we buy from Premier One, uh, plug-in fencer, uh, the water tank. We just used some mineral tubs. The free feed from April through September is where we were grazing them on other people's land. And then we also had some feed in our, our barn that had been there for probably 10 years. So uh, a total of a little over $2,300. That doesn't count uh, the labor of the fuel. And here's a picture of the first job. Uh, some of the machinery is gone, but um, I would mow as close as I could to that stuff. But there were still, we were getting some pig weeds and some iron weeds and stuff growing up through there. Uh, the grove was a mixture of grass and a lot of weeds and some saplings and some low hanging branches. Uh, so obviously we were soon in need of some more feed. Uh, another neighbor of ours had a very large and overgrown grove he wanted cleaned up. It also had a lot of down limbs and a lot of iron and a lot of fences. So he was a little apprehensive about uh, take his mower through there. Since uh, we needed feed, it was seemed to be kind of a perfect solution for both of our problems. Uh, right here, these are before and after pictures that we took. Uh, they were taken from the, there was a main pavement right in front of there. And as you can see, it was a pretty drastic change. And we had a lot of people asking, you know, are those your goats along the Jolly Highway? So it created quite a stir in, in and around the community. Our next job came to us, and then we actually had three more lined up before we were ready to move the goats off that job. Uh, these sites were all really close to each other, so our road time was very short, but our setup time, on the other hand, it took a little longer. We were still pretty green, and as my wife will probably tell you, things didn't always go smoothly. Uh, as far as income goes, we didn't talk or we didn't charge our landowners um, as it was mutually beneficial to both of us and the landowners. In retrospect, we probably made a mistake by not doing by not charging, but it did give us some publicity. We made a few small purchases from Craigslist and local auctions to help increase our herd size, and these didn't always work out so well, so we decided to try and grow solely through our own breeding program. Uh, our first year, we borrowed a billy from our neighbor, and we immediately started retaining the females and selling the weathers. So kind of the first year recap, besides the equipment purchase and the increased herd size and getting our name out there, probably the most valuable thing we gained the first year was our experience. Since then, we have been improving on all aspects of the business. Uh, we are very efficient at our moves. We would load the goats on an enclosed trailer, and if the location does not have running water, 
I will throw in two mineral tubs full of water. But generally by the time we get to the location, only about half the water is still in the tubs. Uh, these tubs will be replenished periodically with like a portable 55-gallon drum. Then we throw all the equipment as far as we need as fences and fencers and ground rods and post pounders into the back of the pickup. And when we get to where we're going, we just unhook the trailer uh, right inside the fenced area. And um, then we go around the perimeter and drop a fence about every 160 feet. And Jamie will unroll the fence and I will push in the post. After that, we hook up the fencer, let the goats out, and leave the trailer door open. That way they got a place to go for shelter. I would say most places um, we are in and out in less than two hours. Keep in mind that we are pretty fortunate that most of the sites we go to have electricity and they also have water. So We have also purchased two enclosed trailers at a fairly reasonable price. And this coupled with the fact that we have multiple fencers allows us to split the herd up and we can keep the goats in one place longer. Right now we have a great relationship with all the people we work with. Oh, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> uh, like I said, right now we have a great relationship with all the people we work with, and we can count on every one of them to keep an eye on the goats if we can't make it there for a couple of days. Uh, plus, they all seem eager to keep the water tubs full. Uh, we know they enjoy them because they will. We will hear stories about the spotted one is mean to the tan one, or the one with the stripe on the belly climbing clear to the top of the field cultivator. We love hearing stories like that. But we'd like to veer in a little different direction by finding paying customers. Uh, last summer, Jamie designed some flyers and we dropped them and dropped them off at the NRCS, the DNR, and the Conservation Office. And they were all interested in what we were doing, but we didn't have much luck in nailing down a job. The NRCS did tell us that if anyone was interested, their department would pay up to 80% of the cost for the right situation. And we also developed a Facebook page which got a lot of likes, but again, it didn't generate any paying jobs. It's on this page that we put down some concrete numbers as far as our fees. And with no other price to gauge off of, we pretty much took an estimated guess at what we thought customers would be willing to pay. So. The prices we came up with kind of went like this. Uh, we were going to charge 50 cents a loaded mile for transportation, and then $7 a roll for the fence setup. And the rolls are 164 feet long, and then $2 a head a day per goat. As with any venture, we've had some adversities and successes, but our main goal is to start marketing towards paying customers, and hopefully tonight's farm and all will help us point us in the right direction. So that's kind of all I have as far as my slideshow goes. Okay. You bet. Thank you, Doug. And so now we'll turn it over to Lonnie. And I want you to remember, Doug, if you have any questions for Lonnie, to open it up as a discussion and unmute yourself and, and just interject and ask her as she's going along. Okay. I will do that. Thank you. All right, Lonnie, Lonnie, go for it. Go for it. Thank you, Megan. Is my voice coming through clearly? It sure is. It sure is. Okay. Okay, I'm going to tell a story, and I'm going to go very quickly because I have a lot to tell. So uh, don't spend any time writing anything down. Just watch and listen to the story. Congratulations. Congratulations, Doug. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. I think you're off to a good start. And uh, hopefully I can be of some help to you somewhere along the way. So this is over a thousand head. This is right southwest of Denver on a job. And um, I'm an old cattle rancher, born and raised in the sand hills of Nebraska. At 33, I went to college and got a degree in environmental restoration, botany, biology, 
and a master's degree in weed science. It was in grad school at Colorado State University that I read about how well goats eat weeds. Before that, I only knew cattle and horses. And I had an idea that I thought somebody, not me, but somebody ought to start a business that used the right species of livestock for the right species of plants. And it would be an alternative to herbicides and machinery. So my two sons and I started this business. Oops, I was trying to advance by thing. My two sons and I, this is in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, Reggie's in the orange, Donnie's in the red. We three started this business in 97 with 100 head of goats. As quickly as we could, we went to 2,500, and now we try to stay between 1 and 2,000. Uh, Reggie went off to start his own fencing business, and in 08, he'll come back and help us. Donnie in the red shirt came back in 09, and he and I run this business together. Our mission is to provide landowners an alternative to chemicals and mechanical methods, which I call chasing symptoms. For people who are land stewards, and we use managed goat grazing to build a living, functioning ecosystem where the desired plants all sustain each other. Everything is balanced, and this is goal-oriented instead of chasing symptoms. So the old way to do it with a lot of machinery and chemicals, here's how we do it. This is about 1,200 head of goats. It's 150,000 pounds of living energy and the workforce. And you can get a lot done with that many pounds of tools. So it's a self-propelled machine, and I, I change these numbers as, a, as the herd changes. But they're doing about 12 things at the same time, and they're living, they're alive, and they're self-propelled. They're recycling, they're crushing up the seeds, they're fertilizing, irrigating, aerating, 1,000 heads, 4,000 hooves. They're trampling the, the soil, they're mulching the soil, mitigation of erosion, preparing the seed bed, packing the seed bed, bringing that living energy to the entire system, uh, packing the road bed, that's not on every job, and fire mitigation. The fuel for the goat herd is all the undesirable plants. Here's a great example in Colorado Springs of the miserable and expensive failure of herbicides. They sprayed these. This is a biannual, common mullen, and sprayed it, and it didn't kill it. It mutated it. So you have all these seeds that are mutated, and the job was not done. So then I came in with the goats, and they cleaned it all up, ate all the seeds, and did everything that was on that last slide of the 12 things. Recycling, fertilizing, irrigating, aerating, trampling, mitigating erosion. This is a very steep hillside above Colorado Springs. And fire mitigation. They're doing it all, and they're self-propelled. A lot of people say to me, well, we can't afford your goats. What I say is you can't afford not to use them. So what I am is a professional grazier. And we do weed management, brush control, fire fuel load mitigation, erosion mitigation, flood control, reclamation work, especially oil field reclamation, which this picture is in an oil field, southwestern Wyoming, and reseeding. We have contracts with the federal government, state governments, county, city governments, private landowners, local groups, homeowners associations, and giant corporations like Chevron Oil. So this is really all very easy, and all you have to do is manage the risk. Very simple. So the risk that you need to manage in running this job are you need to manage the animals, the plants, living in a camper, public relations and education, and you've got to identify the expectations of who you're working for and who is important. You've got to tell them the expectations before they are disappointed in something. You've got to have contracts. You have to work with the weather. It's very important to be in the right season on the right plant to be able to get a good job done. And then you've got to manage your business. And safety is a very big deal. Safety to the animals and all the people. 
the general public plus yourself and whoever's with the goats, employees if you have them, and then you have to have a plan B, emergency backup for everything. And like Doug said, sometimes things don't go right. I was on this job right in the middle of the city of Denver. I had 900 head. These are two big weathers. They weigh probably 220 pounds. And they got their horns all caught up in uh, this orange stuff they had around a pit that they were digging. And they were spinning round and round and headed to a very busy street. And uh, I was there by myself. And I roped him. I roped one. I healed him and, and tied him down and cut that stuff off. But you just have to <laughs> know what to do and be able to take care of it all the time. You never know what's coming and you never know when. Sometimes it's our own stuff that gets caught in the fence. And sometimes it's uh, antelope. I think I missed a slide here. No, I didn't. Okay, so here we're managing our stuff and the antelope all in the same spot. And there's a baby antelope that got caught in the fence. And uh, I don't have a picture, but my son Donnie had to wrestle a full-grown male buck antelope that got caught in our fence. And it was an all-out battle of brute strength to, to get that uh, buck antelope out of the fence before he got killed. And I'm, I'm saying that it was, it was a tough battle. So risk management, you've got to use common sense. You have to stay in balance in everything. For instance, balance, you must have enough paying jobs and enough trained goats to go do the jobs and enough trained people to be able to go on those jobs. You must be professional at all times. You've got to be very, very flexible. And somebody, at least one person on the crew, has got to have the passion for this. And you must work with the highest of integrity. So now I'm just going to go individually. The animals. So you have to manage the goats, and that's the herd management. We use border collies, but you know how are you going to manage these animals to get them to and from, and how to move them around, and how to get them back if they get away? Then the goats, you have to manage their health, the breeding and the kidding, the behavior, the trucking to different jobs, and you've got to develop a rapport with the herd so they mind you. And I do all that with mutual respect, respect for the goats, uh, respect to and between and among all of us. Goats, dogs, land, and the people. So then you have to manage your dogs, the herding dogs and the guardian dogs, but then you have to manage everyone else's dogs who's illegally running them off leash and you never know when they're going to show up and attack your herd. Usually everywhere I go it's illegal to have a dog off leash, but people do it all the time and you never know which one's going to attack you. Uh, in Colorado Springs this year in the middle of the city, a pit bull jumped a six-foot fence and uh, got inside the herd. And indeed, it's a, it's a two-acre fence, and we had the gates padlocked, and that dog jumped the fence. So the pit bull was attacking the goats inside this padlock fence. And uh, my son ran and jumped the fence and tackled the pit bull. But you just never know. You never know when that's going to happen. And then you have to manage the Say, Donnie. Say, Donnie. Yes? Say, I, uh, Say I, you have to forgive, uh, me, if have to forgive me if I'm asking you something you already talked about, but I was kind of wondering how big your herd was and then how many goats or how many dogs you used to run those, those goats. Um, well, a thousand head. Oh, okay. I got that, Steve. Um, we have good border collies, and to me, they're the key to the entire operation. So um, one dog, one good dog per thousand. I've had one good dog per 2,500, but that's really hard work on a dog. Of course, you have to have backup dogs in case one gets sick or lame, or you always have to have young ones coming on, and then the older ones are slowing down. So right now, we have four dogs. So but really, you only need one dog with a thousand head if you have a good dog. Um, did I answer that enough? You bet. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Okay. So then, everywhere you go, you have to manage the predators and then livestock. If you're in working in places where people have horses or llamas or other goats, usually that's not 
uh, the case, but cattle, cattle, horses, some other kind of livestock that is around you. Whoops, I'm jumping. So here's in an oil field. Okay, I've got a touchy thing here. It keeps jumping. Uh, that's Sally, a guard dog. She's an Akbosh. And we are in an oil field, southwest Wyoming. This is a contract for Chevron. And we run on about 2 million acres. But this field is 50,000 acres. And they give us a map and tell us where they want us to go. And each year it's different. Each year they give me a different map. So there we are coming down a road right away. And we're kidding. Now, I do everything different than everyone else. We work all the time. All of my income is from these jobs where we're grazing for income. So we're kidding on the job, moving on the job. And this picture of these babies, that little gray one there, was less than one day old. And that's his mama, the gray mama in there. And I had to walk them about three miles to get to my next well site. And I went up this road. I was walking them up the road. And it's, um, it's so different than how anyone else manages. And there I am, and they're strung out on the road, and I have my dogs in the back. And I try to keep the front end slowed down enough so it doesn't leave a bunch of babies in the back end. But these babies are born. They start eating the weeds on the first day of their life. Their mothers teach them everything. And they're paid. As soon as they're born, they're paid because that's my numbers. Uh, they're, they were playing on the water truck. Chevron brings us a tanker water truck to wherever I call them and tell them to put it. And the goats are playing on that, running up and down. And this year was so hot and so dry and there was no shade anywhere. So I called the water truck company and asked them if, if I could have the goats on and around that truck because we had no shade. And they said I could, but then I had to buy a new rubber around the windshield wipers because the goats played on that and ran. They would run the full length of that truck and jump to the cab. It was really funny watching them. But I had to buy new windshield wipers and the rubber molding. So again, it was so hot and dry there and we're moving across this huge oil field every day. All these babies are walking from site to site to site and there was no shade. So my predator here was H2S gas, hydrogen sulfide gas very very toxic and it's heavy so it rolls in a cloud you can't see it, it's invisible rolls in a cloud to low spots so it would go down the badger holes and these babies would climb down into the badger holes to for shade because there was no shade and i lost a lot of babies to hydrogen sulfide gas something i never thought of before as a predator wild horses a lot of wild horses out there and there's a herd of about six stud horses that you really have to be careful of, and sometimes they run through the electric fence, which always causes trouble. So now to the plants. You need to know the undesirable plants, the desirable plants, previous management, what was done. For instance, some chemicals used, are there residue, uh, residues left over? Has this been overgrazed by something or overrested? And was there some kind of a stress? Was there a fire or a drought or, or who knows what? You need to know all these things. And genus, genus and species information on all of these plants, their growth habit, whether they're annual, biannual, perennial, woody, whether they're poisonous, whether they're listed as a noxious weed, and which plant family they're in so you know the characteristics of it. It's also very important to know soil information. So here's an example on a, um, this is a federal contract on an Air Force base. And this timing was so critical because in this 100 acre site in this exact area, there was a noxious weed, which is that yellow Dalmatian toad flax. There was an endangered species in the bottom, which is Colorado butterfly plant. And then poisonous plant, this purple flower is wild iris. So we had all three of those in the same area, and we had exactly 10 days to cover over 100 acres, which is moving really fast. So timing is very critical, and we had a very small window to get all that done, and we did. When you talk about natural succession of plants, with a big herd of goats, I can push succession forward, or I can push it backward. 
So pushing succession forward, let's say you start with bare ground because of a stress, like in the oil field, you know, they built a pipeline and you have bare ground. First shows up annual weeds, then biannuals, then perennials, and then brush, and then trees, and that's natural succession. So going frontwards, you end up at trees, going backwards, back to bare ground. Here's an example in the oil field where the oil pad there on the left is bare ground. It's the well site. Clear out on the outskirts is sagebrush, and that is the natural environment there, the natural habitat. In the middle are the grasses that we grew. So I started with bare ground, which was on the left, and had my electric fence on this exact well site line, and brought the nutrition and the health to the soil to build the soil such that we could grow grass. So here's a perfect picture of pushing succession forward and backwards in the exact same site. So the brush, if I fenced out into that brush, the goats would eat the brush first. They're browsers, not grazers. So it would mitigate the brush and push it back to, to open grasslands. And then the bare ground, I'm pushing forward to grasslands, both in the same spot. Camper living, that's a big one. Safety, a lot of people um, don't know that Propane is left-hand threaded. It's just, uh, if you have people working for you, you have to be very conscious of carbon monoxide, of living in a camper. You must be very clean, neat and tidy, no trash, manage the porta potties showers if there's no water in the camper, and haul your drinking water. Um, this is a picture, this is a Chevron contract in western Colorado, and you can see our campers down here in the bottom. This was a huge canyon, a box canyon, 100,000 acres. And uh, it was our job in there to have, well, we had a map and they told us where they wanted us to be. But they told us that there were eight mountain lions and 22 bears right in our little site. It was a drought year and the, there was only water in about a quarter mile of the creek, which is right below where our camp was. So we're worried about these predators, the lions and the bears, and what came indeed was fire. So we're in a box canyon at 100,000 acres and Chevron came, I wasn't there right at that moment, but Chevron came and ordered Donnie to get out. And all he could do was load the border collies and the pickup and drive away. So he drove away, left 1,500 head of goats, two guard dogs, all of our campers, all of our campers, our trailers, all of our fence, everything, and had to drive away out of there was gone four days before Chevron allowed us to go back in. And indeed, we lost nothing. It, it turned out well, but it wouldn't have had to go that way. But we were worried about mountain lions and bears, and it was the fire that came. So then you have public relations and education. You've got to be able to explain goal setting for the land. You have to be able to articulate scientific soil information and plant species information. Compare and contrast costs of all the different treatment methods. Always have to be friendly, courteous, professional, respectful, and have good, reliable working equipment. You're always in someone else's neighborhood, and that includes the predators too. And always, you must be ready for the animal rights activists. They've popped up over the years. It's always such a surprise, and it's uh, scary. And uh, they, you just have to deal with that all the time. And once again, on the education part is you've got to, ahead of time, let everyone know the expectation. What is this going to look like when the goats are done? It doesn't look like you mowed it, or maybe it does, depends on how long you stay. But you've got to, you, you've just got to tell them the expectations. Um, here's some great PR work. This is in a public park in Colorado Springs. This indeed is that fenced off area where we had the goats. This is uh, organic gardens in the summertime. In the winter, we use it for our night corral. And we work here every year. We've been here 16 years in a row. And depending on which time of year, we'll use that for our, quote, night corral. And uh, it's padlock gate. So this is where that uh, pit bull jumped the fence. And this is my son, Donnie, that tackled the pit bull. Contracts. You've got to have contracts if, to get paid and have an attorney review them, try and keep them as simple as possible. I carry $2 million commercial liability insurance, and with my 
most of my contracts and the insurance company, I had to write the language. There was no language for such a thing as goat grazing, uh, especially with the federal, um, when you work with federal agencies, it, it didn't have language for that. So we wrote it from scratch and also the liability insurance company. Bidding, each job I bid individually because there are rarely two that are the same. Again, explain your expectations. Uh, work in concert and make sure you get your permits and agreements beforehand. So water, I know you guys want to know about water. This is in another oil field in the middle of Wyoming for Chevron oil. And there's lots of water in the pastures, but my contract says that we cannot have any surface water. The goats cannot drink any surface water. So they bring us a truck full of water and we have to put it into our troughs that we carry and move around. And it's also in my contract that, that they will bring us the truck full of water. We are to deliver the water into the troughs and that water cannot be used for any other purpose except giving the goats a drink. And that's very specifically written out in my contract. Also, this is just in the oil field and here's a couple of dogs, our good dogs, and there's the water truck up on the hill. But then the cattle rancher that has the grazing rights off on the west side of this, um, didn't like the goats there, didn't like anything messing up his old paradigm. And he tried to get the environmental assessment pulled so we couldn't work there anymore. So what the BLM did was um, gave us a contract but they tightened restrictions up on us. And now we, to get from one site to the next, we have to walk on the road. I have a 15 foot berth on either side of that road and I have to be on that road. So the, it's really a, a wild and crazy adventure trying to keep a big herd like this when you get strung out. And you can see the babies, the young babies here in the back, and keep everything on the road or 15 feet from it. And then also you're dealing with the oil field traffic that's coming down there at a high rate of speed. So these contracts with Chevron Oil were out in the big, big country, you know, 50,000 acres, you're on a million acres in the middle of Wyoming, it's 75 miles to the nearest town, 75 miles to go get gas or groceries. It, you have to plan your days very well. And the, the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, it's federal land, BLM manages the land, manages the land for those of us who own it. The cattle rancher has a grazing permit on the land Chevron Oil owns the mineral rights under the land or leases them and Chevron is responsible for taking care of the weeds on any of their disturbances and I'm the contractor. So all of us have to get along. Season of work. It's very important to be on the plant in the right season and animals eat and behave differently. Nutritional needs are much different. Plants grow differently and they respond differently depending on the season of work. Predators are different, weather's different, everything is different, and each season is, is, uh, must be managed for that season. Here's a picture, uh, you can see the date, January 11th, and these goats are in a cotton field in northern Texas, and they're eating the cotton bowls. You know, there was four seeds there, and this is the cotton that wasn't picked up by the cotton picker, so the goats are eating it. It was fabulous nutrition there. Uh, this is Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Beautiful, but you better not be there in the winter. We go there in the summertime, and this indeed was a job we got with the uh, Shooting Star Golf Course, a very exclusive golf course there, and it was very, very um, um, precise management. You can see how narrow, how close this electric fence is to each other there, and uh, <laughs> you had to be very quiet. I couldn't do that job. My son had to do it because he's a golfer, so he knows golf etiquette, which I don't. So you have to be quiet. You had to wait for people to tee off, and these are very, very wealthy people. Wait for people to tee off. Uh, you can't cross the sidewalk. You can't put goat poop here and there. And the reason we got this job was because no, peop no young people um, tried to get the job of the summertime work. So not anybody tried to get the job and I, I guess one kid did and he drove a tractor two hours and quit and said it was way too hard. So they had this budget and nobody to work it. So we got the contract for the goats. And here it is on one of the greens, but 
The goats can't step on the greens. You can't yell at the dogs. Very specific management to work on a billionaire's golf course. So then you have the business. Now, my degrees are in plants and botany and weeds, and my son has a degree in business management, and he's getting his master's now, an MBA. So he runs the business side of things, and I can't even tell you how happy my accountant was when he took over the books and took over the business stuff, which I don't know anything about. So your business, you know, you have all of your, your people in order, your insurance in order, the accountants, the attorneys, checking your contracts. You've got to figure in your profit. You have to do forecasting for how you're going to run your year, um, overhead and the bidding. And then the economy, politics, everything changes every year. You never know. And that's why everything I own has four legs or four wheels because I go to where the money is and the education and awareness is. So I go, whoever calls me, that's where I go. And every state is different and things change all the time. So this is in Cheyenne, Wyoming last summer. And if you'll notice the date down there, it's July the 3rd. So I can't hear you guys, but can anyone guess what the predator problem was here on July 3rd? Okay, I'll tell you. Fireworks. Fireworks are legal in Wyoming and this is in the middle of Cheyenne and oh boy, trying to hold goats inside my portable electric fence all during the middle of the night, during the day, during the night, and everybody shooting off fireworks was very difficult, but fireworks is a terrible predator, and my border collies hate those loud noises, so if the goats did get out, you know, you don't have a dog because they're running to hide because they don't like that noise either. So it's a difficult predator. Safety, again, the animals and the people, um, you just have to be conscious of safety of everyone all the time. And this is in Cheyenne running, running across a public park, again, right before the 4th of July. And the night of the 4th of July, the uh, people partying out here in this park in the middle of the night, they went till 4 o'clock in the morning and they all start shooting fireworks. You're not supposed to shoot in the city, but they do. And I had my goats right on the south end of this park. So it was pretty wild and western. Employees. If you get very big, you're going to have to have an employee. And how I pay them is their level of responsibility, the skills they have, their own equipment they have. Uh, some of them don't have any money. They have a car, but they can't fix a flat tire, and you're always fronting them money. They don't have proper clothing. You have to take care of them. Um, you have to bet that they'll have common sense and work ethic and time management skills. I've been in serious trouble a couple of times because of bad tempers that you didn't know about until it flared. And uh, you, some, uh, some employees are really good, but you do not want them talking to the public, their PR skills. And then I've had many times where they walked off the job in, a, in the middle of a city or something and left me in a very serious situation. And then you have to have plan B. For every one of those categories I've just gone through, you've got to have an emergency backup plan for every single one of them. And when everything goes wrong, you can bet who, whose fault it is. Yep, mine. So uh, on one of my Chevron jobs, we had to wear hard hats and fire retardant clothing, steel-toed boots and goggles. So I put this, these stickers on my hard hat. And now I'm just going to zip through some things of different places we go. This is XL Energy in downtown Denver. There's downtown Denver there. Weeds on the hillside. And running our fence up and down, we're under those giant transformers there. And couldn't set any fence here. This is gates where all the trucks come in. So we're holding this herd of goats here with one dog. That's Zippy. So my boss came and said, would you run over and do the water holding ponds under Interstate 25? And I said, sure. He said, you going to truck them over there? We had 500 head. I said, no, I'm going to run them with a the dog. And he laughed and he said, we're all taking bets in the office. You'll be in jail by 5 o'clock. So I called the, the local sheriff in the county I was in and told him I was going to run down the street with a dog. And in and that's what you have to have is one good dog that you can depend on. So that's what I did. And they sent a squad car and flagged us through the stoplight. And this is Denver rush hour Friday afternoon. 
And there's Zippy over on the right side of the photo there. 500 goats, one dog. I was in front with a camera and this is a kid working for me. Orange flag and a dog, you're fearless. Top of the Crazy Woman Mountains in Montana. I put a thousand head of goats and a thousand head of cows and we were doing uh, leafy spurge mitigation there. And that's all about diversity. You can expect positive changes and it's all about diversity. Ecological diversity, financial, they can lower their outside inputs. If they bought a thousand head of goats, they would have two incomes on the same amount of land. And of course, cultural and social diversity and the animal behavior diversity. When we come in, uh, everything changes behavior, especially the people. Here's uh, my son Donnie and Zippy. Zippy's over on the right side. One dog, one guy, one dog. And this is on the Air Force Base at Cheyenne, Wyoming on a federal contract. And he's running the goats across this bridge, jump the guardrail and down into the gate hole of our electric fence there. But you can see how well behaved these goats are. And most of these are big weathers. My favorites are the big weathers. And, you know, I have like 500 hit of six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old weathers. And they're my favorites. And they remember when you go back year after year to jobs, they remember. So a thousand goats is 4,000 hooves. They're living, they're self-propelled. They're eating 3% of their body weight per day. Goats are ruminants with four stomachs. They have unique enzyme and bacteria and very narrow pointed mouths with lateral jaw movements that crushes and destroys viable seeds. Goats are browsers, not grazers. So they like everything else except grass. And uh, um, indeed, it's very well studied viable seed going through a goat's gut. In the case of leafy spurge, going through a goat's gut, 99.998% of viable seed is destroyed. And most of that's by the shape of their mouth and how they chew. Of course, like I said, and I can't say it enough, a good dog is the key to the operation. It's If you only have one thing, you better have one good dog. Uh, this is in an oil field, southwestern Wyoming, and very tough conditions. It's seven inches annual precip, and that's average, so if it's a drought year, you don't get that much. 7,500 foot elevation, so the season is short, the growing season is short. The pH of the soils are very high, very alkaline, and soil organic matter is very low. So this is when I first got there. This is for Chevron. And I started this job on September 15th of 09. So if you look in this fenced area here, it's bare ground, and then the plants you see are halogen, and that's a very poisonous plant. That's all they had to eat was halogen, halogen or bare ground. So we fenced this. And if you have 1,500 head fencing where there's not much to eat, you have to go really fast. So it's my desire to try and get them to the density of a million pounds of goats per acre, which is really hard to do. you got to pack them in there. And that's why I don't like working with less than 500 head because you cannot get this kind of an impact when you don't have, when you, you know, 10 animals or or 50, it's really, really hard to get this kind of an impact than you can with this many head. So anyway, started this in September and not even one year later, this is what we had. And we seeded grass too. We had a, we uh, just hand seeded grass as we went on this right away. And this was just 10 months later and uh, Chevron and the president of the bank came out from Rock Springs, everybody came out there and they said, we've been trying to grow something here for 60 years and we could never get anything to grow. Of course they had their machinery and they'd rip it up and plow it and disc it and plant grass seed and then come and spray the weeds, which halogen is an annual, and plant again and nothing would grow. 60 years, so we did it in less than a year. Uh-oh, I'm not advancing here. Okay, so so my deal is to feed the system. I don't want to go out and kill those weeds. I want to use them and recycle all the nutrients that are tied up in there. I want to build the nutrition. I want more diversity and more diversity is stability. It's always hilarious in the oil field. Of course the shade here is the oil tank and those goats run up and down the steps. Sometimes there's a goat on every step. They're all lounging there and they're playing up and down the stairs. 
This is in Northern California. Spent the winter there one year, and it was very difficult. This is the buildings 45 miles west of Red Bluff. My camp was on the far horizon on the hill. There, up there. I had 2,200 goats, and I could never see them because it was such thick brush. Most of it was poison oak. I didn't get it, but an employee had poison oak all winter, and it, I think it drove him crazy. I could never see the goats. I just assumed they were there. The brush was so thick. They said that uh, the, uh, the predators there or the hazards were wild pigs in the underbrush, western diamondback rattlesnakes, and the Mexican drug mafia. So I had one western diamondback back underneath my camper. Never saw the, the mafia. And uh, they sent out, they wanted to do a, a show and tell day, and they sent out, I thought they were range cons. They said con, but I thought range cons to come and cut us a path so we could set up a, a field day. Well, it was convicts. They sent two loads of convicts. <laughs> they took chainsaws and cut a path in the hillside so we could do a demonstration of how the goats eat brush and take care of the soil and do erosion mitigation in the very steep, uh, fire hazard hills of California. So then this is right outside Yellowstone Park. This is Cody, Wyoming. And here's how I move around. I hire semis, contract them out. They're four decks. And I build a funnel that goes right to the back of that truck. The trucker carries a portable chute with him. And we load all four decks. The two people here, they just worked on the ranch, the horse trainer and the horse shore. And I gave them a fence post and said, keep the front goat moving. Keep the front goat moving. Then I was in the back with the dog, bringing him to him. So you can see my entire overhead of the business right here. I have a pickup which pulls my camper. In the back of the pickup are my dog kennels, water tanks, electric fence, batteries. And then I sometimes I pull this old horse trailer here on the left to carry everything. But if I don't pull that, everything is in the back of my pickup or in my camper. All the goats are on that Ford X semi or two trucks or three trucks, depending on how many we have. So then you get to where you're going, you open all the doors and they all jump out. So you don't have to have a chute or anything. The, uh, this is in Wyoming. A lot of times you have to make sure that that truck can turn around and get out of there. So I unload wherever the heck I am and use a border collie to run them wherever I'm going. In this case, at the pipeline. So why this works so well is because goats are browsers and they're completely opposite the horses and cattle who are grazers. Everywhere I go, I take soils tests so I know what I'm working with and what to plant. I take care of the soil. 364 days a year, we are getting ready for the rain because the soil is the secret. And we try to increase the organic matter and hold the water. And this is just soils tests things that you can learn from it. The, uh, if you look at the fungi, this place that was sprayed with an herbicide um, impacted the fungi two orders of magnitude. So land restoration, instead of going out and trying to kill weeds, I want to know what's missing. This is a paradigm shift. You want to add new energy, add life, add ideas, add creativity and excitement. There's nothing as exciting as when you bring a thousand head of goats to a job or to the middle of the city and feed the system. You feed the soil, plants, animals, and the people. And you're adding all this stuff, all this joy. You're recycling knowledge and you're adding a whole business layer in there that, that wasn't there before. And uh, so what was before? Giant machinery. Giant machinery, little machinery. And you guys who farm in Iowa People always ask me how many goats I'm going to bring. They said, I have 10 acres. And I said, well, I'm going to bring 1,000 head and stay two hours because that's the best job I can do. So to put it in terms of Iowa farmers, I would say if you have a 400-acre field, would you take a rototiller or would you take this? Same, it's the same way I would answer. If I have 100 acres to do, am I going to take this or am I going to take this? I'm going to take the whole herd so I can get a great impact and get done. Again, it's managed goats. They're living. It's an alternative to chemicals and machinery that are not living. So that's how we do it. I 
have a pack saddle, but I haven't had the guts yet to put the native seed mix on there, which is very expensive. I was afraid the goat would stand still. So they're doing 12 things and we hand seed and then the herd does all the work. They have their babies on the job and what's important to these babies when you're working in a watershed and taking care of the land. When you take care of the land, soil and water, it needs to be clean, healthy and nutritious. And what's important to these babies is important to these babies is important to these babies. This is back in the middle of the city again with all the people that come and watch and no one gets to see big herds of animals. Now I'm going to hop to southern Nebraska where I spent the winter last winter and the species of importance there was wild marijuana, eastern red cedar trees, and musk thistle. But what I want to show you here is we had about 1,200 head of goats and land shaping. So this is horrible erosion from runoff of water in these draws and we put these goats, we set a night pen and this is night number one, night number two, and night number three. We're completely reshaping the land with that herd by moving it perpendicular to the, to the uh, erosion trouble. Uh, water again, usually water, I don't bid a job unless water is provided or it's there. And if I have to haul water, then I just add that into my price but I like it when they do. This is back to the Air Force Base where the danger here was that building in the background. We didn't know it, but that's where the nuclear warheads were stored. And my son was taking a picture of his pickup and he got descended upon and handcuffed and thrown down and kicked out of there because he had a picture of that building in the background. We had no idea. Hovering helicopters, I find, are the worst thing that scare goats. They don't run out of the fence, but the worst thing is a hovering helicopter to scare them. Um, they eat cactus, all kinds of cactus. And there's a huge need for documentation and publishing this information. Um, interestingly, all the research done now, most of it was paid for by chemical companies. So when chemical companies pay for research, they give you the question. There is no research and, and information on the shelves of goat grazing. So I would really like to get some research and some information um, published. So it's on the shelf for people who are doing land ownership, land managing, to uh, know what to do, what it costs, when to do it, all the details that Doug and I are working on because we need that information on the shelf. Uh, goats are very unique. They climb trees, stand on their hind legs. This is great for fire mitigation. This is oak brush in Colorado, fire mitigation. And here's a very talented big weather goat. Uh, timing, Canada thistle. I want to be at, uh, on Canada thistle at the exact time of growth that the goats love it, which is this full bud before flower and it's about nose high to a goat and if it's in this they eat it the fastest they love it the most and we can do a huge job on a high trot if it's in this growth stage after it flowers it uh, they don't like it as well and it slows us down but you can still do it that's the after picture but see now I'm done so I left the grass there which is two feet tall of grass and they just ate all the flowers off the thistle and then I left. I'm finished. It's a big balance of science and art of how to run this business. And again, my employee of the month is one of my dogs. And one dog, you're never afraid. You have no fear if you have one good dog with you. It doesn't matter where you are, day or night, anywhere. That dog is going to take care of everything. And with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you so much, Lonnie. That Thank was you very so informative. Much, Lonnie. That was very. And I see there are a few questions on the left hand side. Uh, the first question is from Greg, and he asks if you just are only using electro netting. I was trying to unmute myself. Yes, I use. Uh, um, the same fence that Doug does and 
it's magic. It's magic when you're doing this business. And I never worry about getting a, a superb grounding or the voltage very high. It doesn't matter because what matters most to me is the respect of the animals for the fence. And a lot of times in the city, I can't even turn it on because there's too many people, too many children, so you can't even turn it on. So it's a, um, you know, it's just a symbol. But if your um, animals are very respectful, you don't need to turn it on. And Greg just added, Greg are there any added, other, are there any other portable options? Portable options. Well, the big 16-foot panels and steel posts. Sometimes we'll set that if it's a very high impact needed where we have to hold them in there and make them stay and they can't get out. Or if we're setting a corral to load trucks, you know, we'll build that with 16 foot panels. That's portable, but man, is it hard work. It's heavy and hard work. But the, I see a recommendation for portable fencing in thick brush and woods. I think I would run like three single wires through the brush like that. Or I would just herd. I would just use dogs and herd and not set any fence. And usually that's what I prefer is using dogs. Don't set any fence. Sometimes you can't do that. I find when I'm working with people, people who have the best dogs use the least fence. And people who aren't very good with dogs or don't trust them use the most fence. Um, let's see. Greg, can you just string two or three strands? Yes, you can. I've never tried that, but I know people that have and like it. But once again, I prefer to herd. David asked, how do you handle how, how do you handle how Oh, I live in a camper. Last year in Nebraska, it was 30 below zero. And I lived in a camper all winter, and it's miserable. But last year, 2013, I think I made history because I was paid every single day of the year for my grazing animals. And I'll bet you that's never been done in the world. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. But man, it was miserable cold. But uh, you know, we stayed warm. Um, it, it just wasn't much fun. So uh, there's all kinds of choices, but I've spent the winter in a camper in the Rocky Mountains, Rocky Mountain region, probably uh, 14 years of my 19 years. The older I get, the less fun it is. Um, I see one about training dogs. My first dog I bought was a fully trained dog, and she taught me, because I didn't know about Border Collies. So she taught me, and now uh, we raise our own. We train them. It works best if we raise a puppy in our camp, so that's all they ever know. That's what works the best. But I have bought many at all different stages of training for different reasons. Uh, let's see, where are the goats this winter? The goats right now are at Wellington, Colorado. And I'm trying to guess between storms here. I have a couple of jobs that are east of Denver. And I'm trying to uh, guess between storms of when to go there. So anyway, um, I have about three weeks work right east of Denver, and then they'll go on to New Mexico for about 30 days, roughly the month of April, and then back into the city of Denver for our fourth year contract on the in open space for city of Denver. Let's see, how well do goats survive 20 below? My goats are cashmere. And as you guys notice, looking at the pictures, what I need for my business I need my goats to be skinny and hungry and very well behaved. Because if they're skinny, I can get more on a truck. And uh, they've got to be very well behaved because I get paid every day for, for working. And I don't sell meat. And uh, you could, you know, every, everybody can run it differently. I just don't. Uh, because I'm afraid I'd lose my rapport with my herd if I started selling them for slaughter. So I don't do that. I, I let them run with me and we all work together and uh, their entire lives. So these big weathers I have, have worked with me in 12 states. We've been on the wildest adventures you could ever imagine. We've run with wolves and grizzly bears and hydrogen sulfide gas and pit bulls and <laughs> we just run with everything and survived it and made a living. Because if, if my goats don't behave and I can't make a living, then they have to go to the sale barn. 
So, you know, we have a good thing going together here. Um, I'm getting way behind Megan on questions. Where do you want me to go? <laughs> Question line is SR Anderson. You might have to scroll up. You might have to scroll up. Okay, let me find it. Um, SR Anderson, how much space? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me go back up to 20 below. I've survived 20 below, 30 below, 40 below. You know, you have to be really smart, but I grew up in the sand hills of Nebraska and I'm a ranch girl. So I know how to dress and, and know how to be smart when you're out in the weather. It's also just as bad when it's too hot because, you know, you get dehydrated, goats need water. So it doesn't matter. You just have to know how to survive outside with no barns. We never have barns. You use the lay of the land. Uh, okay, how much space do I need to overwinter the goats and when you're limited on grazing areas? Um, well, I'm never limited on grazing areas, but how much space I would really like to have uh, for a thousand head, at least 20 acres to move on. Um, it, it seems predators would be a serious problem, but I hardly mention it. I don't view predators as a problem, and the worst predators I have always are people's dogs off leash. They're tame, so they, you know, they have no fear of anything. Um, they like that pit bull that jumped the fence and got in. You know, he, he wasn't scared of anything to be around people, and uh, he didn't mind. He, he was a <laughs> behavior problem. He didn't mind his owner. His owner couldn't call him back. The worst single kill I've had is a, a chow. One chow dog ran through the herd and killed 19, snapping its snapping necks as it ran through the herd. One passed through the herd, killed 19 heads, snapping necks. And that whole thing took about seven seconds. That's the worst single kill I've ever had. I've lost goats to eagles. Um, we've run with wolves and grizzly bears. I've never lost any to them. Mountain lions are everywhere. On the front range of Colorado, I'll lose one or two every once in a while, but it's not a problem to me. Um, the, uh, that hydrogen sulfide gas, that was a big problem because we couldn't figure it out. Um, let's see. Is, it, is that enough about predators? It's, you know, I, my attitude is, is that I'm the one who's the outsider, and I come into your neighborhood I and my goats and my dogs and my camper, I come into your neighborhood to do a job. So you already live there. So it's utmost respect I have for you, your family, your roads, your land, your animals, and your, your wildlife that lives there. So they already live there, and I'm the outsider. So I come in and work with the greatest of respect, and I don't try and kill you, and hopefully you don't try and kill me. And... Uh, I just do my job and leave, but I bring help to the land, and I just don't have trouble with predators. Colton, what's my average annual? What's your average annual income? Um, if if we have a uh, if my son and I worked really hard and pushed every single day, we could probably make a million dollars. But about four hundred thousand dollars is our average, and that's we have relaxed time and we'll push hard sometimes. And then we'll have relaxed times where we're not chasing the job so hard. Uh, here in Iowa, a lot of abandoned lands becomes weeds and brome, which is grass. So one would have to run goats and then follow with cows or horses. The first thing I want to know always when I bid a job or someone calls me is, what's the goal for the land? So you're telling me here what's the problem, but I don't know what the goal is. So I first of all need to know the goal because these are, you know, I don't chase symptoms. I go to the goal and I need to know which plants you want there and why. Now sometimes it's a maintenance thing that, um, a maintenance issue like, you know, when they grade gravel roads and you're always going to have that problem where they're pulling the gravel up one side and dumping it on the other. That's a constant problem because it's a road, so it's a sacrifice area. 
So I just need to know what the goal is, and then we can get the right plants in there which suit you, which is your desired plants, instead of a problem. Uh, the goats. Goat. <laughs> yeah, I just electric fence them. They'll eat everything if I make them. Uh, let's see. Raising the rates. How would I determine interest in contract grazing in an area where there's no previous precedent in goat grazing? Also, how would you calculate pricing such as per head for contract grazing? Um, I've never worked for free because I was afraid if I did, I would never get paid again. So no matter how tough it was, I never worked for free. Um, I, everybody, it's my opinion that everyone who works ought to be paid. And if you do good work, you ought to be appreciated. And it's nice to be valued for how good you are. I love it when someone, val when they recognize how good we are and they value us for that. Uh, in city of Cheyenne, it's $5 per head per day, plus trucking, plus my mobilization fee. And that's a good contract. And I'd love to expand that where I was working there four or five months of the year. Um, uh, let me see. I, you know, each job is individually bid because they're so different. They're a different setting, different goals. No two landowners have the same goals, rarely. Everything's different. Seasons are different. So for myself, I kind of have a, a guideline that I don't like to work for less than $800 a day. For $800 a day, I'll come and, and uh, you know, manage my animals on whatever I need to do. But I don't like to work for less than that. So I'm going to say, how do you charge is, what do you want per day? What What is the amount of money that you need per day to make this a business. So let's say that's $200 a day or $400 a day. Well, then you got to have enough goats to be able to charge that to make it work. It's my suggestion that anybody can make a good living with 200 head. So if you had 200 head and you charge two bucks a head a day plus whatever else, you know, that's roughly $400 a day. And then you're a professional herder. A professional brazier. I am a professional brazier. I run a professional business and I expect to be paid professional prices. Uh, did I answer that good enough, Megan? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Okay. Okay, uh, no guardian dogs. Yes, we have an Akbosh guardian dog. I had an Anatolian and an Akbosh, but the Anatoline was too tame and she kept going to the people's houses all the time and uh, she ran away and went to be a pet. So now we just have one Akbosh, that white dog I pointed out a couple of times in the photos, Sally, she goes everywhere with us. But moving fence every day and you're there with them. We live in a camper right on site, you're there. And that's really the best um, suppression of trouble. And, you know, in the city, the worst trouble we have is from the people. And in the middle of the night when the, the young men, it's usually young men, start drinking and get the fireworks, boy, that's when real trouble comes. It has to do with drinking. And, and a lot of people like to scare animals. I don't know why that is, but I think uh, one out of 100 people just loves to scare animals. And they always come, and you just have to deal with it and uh, add that into your contract. In the city of Colorado Springs, that park we work in is a strict law that dogs must be on leash at all times. Last year, 95% of the people were running their dogs off leash. I have no idea why, but this year I'm going to charge them another 10000 bucks if I have to manage the dogs off leash. And if I have to manage those dogs off leash who are breaking the law, then for 10000 bucks I'll do it. Otherwise, I won't. Um, let's see. How did you protect the endangered plants pictured near the middle of the presentation? How we protected those plants is the timing. So the noxious weed was Dalmatian toad flax, and it was in full flower, and the wild iris was in full flower, and we had to be there before the uh, Colorado butterfly plant, which was endangered. We had to be that before it started making seeds. So that's why we had that 10-day window was the only time we could be in there. And 
had to get over is like 120 acres we had to get over in 10 days and we did it. Doug, do you have any questions Doug, for Lonnie? Do you have any questions for Lonnie? Uh, yeah, I just had a, a yeah, couple. Can you hear me okay? Or is Doug, can you hear me okay? Or feedback? Or feedback? Let, let me mute myself, Doug. Okay, uh, I was just to, to start off with, um, you know, as a starting off extremely small, I was kind of curious as to uh, how many goats, when you started all this, how many you started with? If, if you didn't, like I said, I was offline for a little bit, so if you've already answered, uh, please forgive me, but what would you start with for a number? What would you start with for a number? Uh, my two sons and I bought a hundred head and very quickly we went to 2,500 because I went and got investors. I didn't have the money to do that but I went and got investors to buy goats and then I ran them. So we started with a hundred head and I had that old white horse trailer, I still have it, I've driven it over two million miles and I put a hundred head in there, I loaded the nose, I had a little ramp, loaded the nose, had one water tank, uh, five rolls of fence and um, a battery and I drove from Montana, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, New Mexico and that was my advertisement was driving a million miles and working every single day. That's how I started but very quickly I went to 2,500. Okay, um, okay. and uh, the other question I had, question are you, I had, are you are, are you supplementing? I mean, are you, uh, is there, do you ever have to, to feed them extra hay or anything like that? And also, like a mineral tubs or anything like that? Or are they getting everything uh, just through the, just through what they're eating out on the, out west? I don't like to supplement anything, but every once in a while, you know, I'll call the trucker and book to load out on, let's say March the 3rd and then we run out of feed and I'll have to buy some hay because the truck's coming on an exact day and I'm out of food. Sometimes that happens, not very often. Um, we supplement trace mineral blocks. So a 50, plant, 50 pound salt block, I cut it in half with an ax because we have to pick it up and move it, you know, all the time. You're, so we can't feed anything loose because you have to pick it up and move it all the time. So we take those salt blocks and trace mineral but because of how we travel, the goats get a huge diversity of diet and they're very healthy and I don't vaccinate for anything, I don't doctor for anything and I've never trimmed a hoof. But like I said, skinny, hungry, very well behaved and they're very healthy. Um, I've never wormed. Sagebrush is a natural wormer and being in the, the uh, Rocky Mountain West, there's sagebrush everywhere. So I've never wormed them. And I've never had to and that huge diversity of diet keeps them very healthy and prevents the need to supplement you know anything else except salt. Um, Brian, what's a good breed for Midwest climates that could be used for meat animals? I really like the Kiko meat goat and I've crossbred to them a few times. Um, I really like that one a lot. Boars to me are an excellent feedlot animal but they're the hardest for me to use and a couple of times when uh, well if I have trouble in my herd it's got a black head or a brown head it's always the boar that gives me trouble because their personality isn't as respectful and polite they're big they throw their weight around and uh, they just don't behave the electric fence as well as the cashmere and uh, but they're you know they're meant to get fat fast as a meat animal and they do that really well. But I think you could use them but they just don't behave as well as mine and and for me you know I'm different than most everybody else is um, I need to work and be paid every day of the year for my grazing animals. My income is not from selling meat and so you know when you're in production agriculture you're selling meat, you're getting as many pounds of meat on that animal and then selling them. To me, I'm not in production agriculture, I'm in the service business. And the behavior of that animal and the knowledge and the memory of that animal is, is so important to me. 
when we go to Colorado Springs, those goats that have been there, you know, every year of their life in a row, makes that job so easy. But uh, anyway, it's a whole different business and every person I think that would want to do a business like this is going to have their own way and their own way of running it, their own way of making money, whether it's half uh, selling meat and like uh, Doug does of selling the weather kits. My weathers are my favorite animals to work with, but um, he sells weather kids. So you do, you know, part grazing contracts and then the rest by selling meat. Everybody's different. Everybody's in a different area. I, everything I own has four legs or four wheels and I go to where the, the money is. So I work west of the Missouri River, Canada to Mexico. And if you want to stay home, then you have to work in your area of not being able to leave to go to the jobs and then you you know you figure it out so everybody just figures it out for what they have to work with who they have for help and uh how they can do that and it's all different there's no one way to do it it's all different uh, let's see how do i manage the size of the herd given their life expectancy um the, I sell goats to people who want to start a business so they have that behavior. So I don't sell goats for, uh, for slaughter. So uh, they, you know, they say that a goat's average life expectancy is 12 years. I've had a few weathers I knew were 14 years old. And sometimes like those babies that were dying in the badger holes with hydrogen sulfide gas, they lived about seven minutes or a day or two. So you know, it seems like we always come out um, with about the right size of herd. But what's most important to me of being a gypsy is we have to fit on the semi trucks. I hire that trucking done and uh, a semi can haul 50,000 pounds. So we have to stay close to 50,000 pounds. So it's either 50,000, 100,000, 150,000. And that's more important than the numbers is how much do they weigh and how we move around. Now it's been a couple of times in my career that I've run the goats in the highway right away. A uh, couple of times we went about 27 miles in the highway right away. And I think it'd be great fun to run across the United States in the highway right away and uh, not truck anymore, not use any trucking, just walk everywhere I go. So um, let me see. See, what do you do when you end up with a dead goat on a job? If, uh, if I'm out in the country, I just feed it back to the environment and the birds and the fungi. If I'm in the middle of the city, you better get that goat out of sight quickly. Um, people don't like to see dead anything. And just uh, you get it out of sight and get it somewhere where you can dispose of it as quickly as possible. On average, how many goats die on the job? That's, uh, there is no average. Uh, sometimes we'll go several months and nothing will die and then all of a sudden maybe five will die. Uh, because I don't cull, you know, uh, the, these old ones, you know, they work every single day and then when they get tired, they lay down in the sunshine, get out of the wind and just lay down and die. That's what I, that's my gift to them of respect of working their lives and then uh, dying wherever they want to. But um, there just really isn't an average. Um, like the babies, baby goats going down the badger holes and getting the H2S gas. I suppose in a couple of days there, we lost 30 or 40 or 50 head. Hard to tell because we didn't know, we couldn't get them all out. Didn't know where they all were. Lonnie, I have a question. Lonnie, I have a question. And that, and that, what happens if what you, happens if you, if you, from a toxic, from a plant, toxic issue. plant issue. That rarely ever happens because the the way that I manage and having them have eaten all the poisonous plants that I've ever come across, I believe the herd has memory and has the ability to digest all that stuff. So that really, I mean, nothing is toxic to them. But if I know I'm in a poisonous plant area, then we manage very carefully such that we don't force 
the goats to eat only that. Make sure they have a variety of food and then watch them very carefully, but that's just, you know, not a problem. I think the herd has a memory and the ability to eat everything, which is one reason why I think my goats are so valuable is because they do have that memory. Lonnie, this is Doug again. Uh, how many? Uh, how many? How many different? Um, how many okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering how many different groups of goats you're running. Can you hear me? I don't know if I'm muted or not. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can hear you fine. I can hear you fine. Uh, well. Right now they're all in one herd and pretty soon we'll separate them to two herds of a semi-load each. There's two semi-loads here now. And then in about 30 days we'll separate them to two semi-loads. Unless um, I get, I, I bid a, several little small jobs around Denver and if I can fit them in between the storms before the spring blizzards, which I'm betting is April, then We'll split them and Donnie will go run some and I'll run some. And then when they go to New Mexico for the month of April, they'll all go back together. And then when we come back up to Colorado, then they'll split again. Um, at one time, when I had about 2,000 head, I had 500 head in four states. And that's when I learned. I had all my employees calling me, telling me the goats would not stay in the electric fence. Everybody was calling me on the same day telling me the same thing, was Montana, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming, and nobody's goats would stay in the electric fence. And that's, the, that's when I figured out that a full moon, the full moon was the only thing in common, and I started noticing that. And full moon, especially on an equinox or summer solstice, is it gets pretty wild and western. <laughs> Did I answer your question? You bet. And then just uh, the last one I have is uh, how how many rolls of, do you have a count on the count electric netting that you have? Um, I'm sorry, I was trying to mute myself. Do I have a count on what? Uh, the the electro netting that you're you're running to contain the goats. To do the best job, they need to be concentrated and move fast. So I rarely have them in more than eight rolls of fence, which is you know just less than two acres. So I try to hold it less than two acres, then move that very fast. Sometimes um, you know eight rolls of fence, and we'll move it eight times in a day, uh, plus walk them to water or something. Um, I, I don't know. I I think right now we have about twenty. 22 rolls. At one time I had 65 rolls of fence and that was a big headache. I'd rather have brand new fence, keep it as simple as possible. As, as few supplies as I can get away with, I'd like to do. So as few rolls of fence as I can get away with, as few batteries and one good dog. But if you have one good dog, you don't need anything else. Um, let me see. Do I separate new kids and moms? I don't like to, but boy, it depends on which job you're on if you have to. Um, like that I showed you in the oil field in Wyoming, you know, they have their babies and they get their babies up and they walk three miles to the next well site. That's what I prefer. Is they're born, the mama takes care of them. I really prefer the mothers have one kid and take care of it and raise it well. I don't even like twins or triplets because the moms can't keep track of them. Just have one and teach it how to work and keep it with you and take care of it. I never have, I'm talking to Torp again about shelter. We never have shelter and we have to use the lay of the land. And once again, it's so important to be bidding jobs in the right season that we don't get in the wrong kind of a storm for what land we're in. For instance, I would never bid a job where they have ice storms in ice storm uh, timing. You know, that would be a wipeout. It would be horrible. Um, my son has a home base in Wellington, Colorado, and I'm a full-time nomad, but I prefer the word gypsy because I like that word a lot.
Megan, I want to know if you're impressed how many slides I showed in 45 minutes. I'm completely I'm impressed, completely Lonnie. completely impressed, Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, let me see. One last see. question here from, Tor. Might... here from Tor. Okay. Their mom who might have crushed a baby on a cold night might should have separated them from the rest of the herd. I know, that's hindsight, isn't it? You never know. And with this, you know, um, you know, that's again going back to production agriculture to if you're selling pounds of meat, you've got to save every one of those. Whereas I don't because they're, you know, they go to work the next day, they're paid to eat. And if, you know, if I lose, that's why predators don't bother me because if I have to feed a golden eagle and a wolf and a, and a, a, somebody's dog, you know, I'm really paying rent for working in that neighborhood to get along. Or a mountain lion, I'll say a mountain lion. Because a mountain lion, if a mountain lion wants something, a mountain lion's going to take it. And there's nothing you can do about it. And there's nothing you can do to prevent it. And, and that includes my dogs and me, too. If that lion wants it, it's going to take it. So, you know, I pay my rent, work with great respect, and that's the best I can do. And so far, in 20 years, I've, you know, I've not had any bad luck. Okay, it says Ed is typing. I'll wait for Ed. <laughs> nope, Torp. Uh, oh, you're welcome, Jenna. But everybody, um, you know, you're all doing great things and keep on doing it. Um, I don't know how to tell you how to get paid, but maybe, maybe we can brainstorm more on that. I think. Doug, you're just on the right track, but you've got to get some experience so you're very confident that you're going to come in there and do a professional job and get a professional pay check for it, just like everybody else. But you've got to do professional work and know the plants and, and you know, be very confident that you know what you're doing. One last question from Ed. Uh, One last question from Ed. Okay, breeding. No, I do not let nature take its course with breeding. And we breed very specifically. We will start kidding on May 17th, which in the Rocky Mountains, we just can't kid any before that or we get in trouble with bad weather. Uh, wet spring snows and cold. It, that cold, wet, heavy snow. And it's just, we just can't kid before that if you're out on the landscape and you have no barn or anything and no feed. So the feed has to be there and it has to be warm enough, especially in the daytime. So we will begin kidding this year, May 17th. So we keep our kidding window as short as possible. So 21 days. So we'll put in 10 billy goats 21 days and pull them out. And I rent goats and then send them back. Never keep billy goats around. And it doesn't matter to me how many babies are born. I just want the mamas have one baby and take care of it and teach it how to work. And that's all I ask. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. It was great.